This is the If More Let's Divide podcast. Yo guys, Charlie, what it happened? Welcome to the F More Let's Divide podcast. And another week, another episode, like we always do, you know. Fred, <laughs> you be like every beginning of this podcast. <laughs> have a try rhyme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but as you say they miss the work, but you know one go back to spoken word. Charlie, <laughs> soon, 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 Charlie. <laughs> you know, say the way how things are going in Ghana, you know, you have to you know multitask diverts more from the art charlie you have to <laughs> yeah. balance yourself yeah charlie because uh, you know fred uh, like apart from sakode and shatawali uh do we have like people like spoken word artists photographers who are living solely of their art here in ghana I I, I yeah. hardly doubt Charlie for find I, something yeah, balance. Yeah, 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 fine. You know, <laughs> you, for, you definitely for find something balance. Or else. You know, but 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 I have friends in like LA, especially New York, especially Atlanta, and else and also in the UK. I have like two friends there who are solely living of art. They get grants, they get funds, they do shows, and they are paid. More mature <laughs> market, I guess. <laughs> yeah, Charlie. Charlie for here. Hmm. <laughs> Your parents have this easy, <laughs> you know, be serious for life inside if this be what you choose to yeah. do. Yeah. And, and don't, don't you remember last last week's episode? Um, no, yeah, la- yeah, last week's episode, um, Bitman has told us that, you know, his friend who has been a music producer for years started selling eggs and he's making more yeah, money. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Charlie. But, Fred, um, th- this, this week we have... An, an, Make you know talk amazing. No, like <laughs> I, I'm I'm going to use a superior word. Yes, please do. We have like a god. Yeah. A, not God per se, not God with a capital G. Like a God. To the culture he is. Yeah. Someone who my grandma, I remember my grandma telling me that. Have you seen that guy? You have to be like that guy. Really? Yes. You know, me, my experience of him has always been from such a distance, yet it felt so close. Yeah. Because you guys were recording. I remember Mensah recording and growing up, his name would just come up like on a daily basis. DKB. And it was like a big deal. You know, it was like a big deal for the neighborhood inside. Like, yeah. Mensah, Mensah, they record for DKB. Charlie, that was a big deal to us. So, yeah, for real. It's good to meet you in person. Charlie, so ladies and gentlemen, help us welcome... David Kwame now Bolton, a.k.a. DKB. Yes, sir. <laughs> Chai, DKB, welcome to the If More, Let's Divide podcast. Yame, 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 yame. <laughs> you know, mm. in, in this... Yeah, I'm a god, so I'm starting. Yeah. <laughs> <the chance. laughs> Chant start. Uh-huh. You know, um, it, it's, it's, so, it's, so, it's so dope because... Um, even though I've met you so many times... I never thought that you would grant me audience one day, especially when my grandma and my mom used you as a yardstick. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I, you know, when I was a child and you were coming on TV, I think once every week, right, or right. once in a while you would appear and do your you know, mag- magical stuff. Hmm. And now you are here. You know, my grandma and my mom of blessed memory, I know that they are looking down and they are so proud. So, Charlie, thank you for coming through. Uh, I'm rather honored to be here. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I don't know where, how we should start this or where we should start this. But we are eventually going to start because we have so many things yes. down to talk about. And you've become a time police. So... <laughs> 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 yeah. we stick to the yeah. script yeah um dkb like off the bat how do you feel anytime you hear your initials on a song uh, um it's a good feeling let me let me just say that it's mm. a good feeling and um for me every song is a memory mm. sort of thing so anytime i hear um, a Mensa song or a VIP mm. or, or Brafo, it's, it's, it's a memory. I remember the process of actually creating mm. it, you know, and the, and the people involved. So it, 
Yeah. For me, that that's what I remember. But yeah. which which one song do you like? Which studio session mm-hmm. is is etched in your brain? Like which wow. one studio session? Like from the nineties, from the two th- early to two thousands. Which one studio session do you vividly remember? I will have to take it in periods. Yeah. The, the first will be the early nineties. You see, yeah, Charlie, you know, <laughs> periods, you know, yeah. you know <laughs> periods. So levels, <laughs> like, like, like t- Tetris. Yeah. You didn't play Tetris. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This yeah. is stage one, level yeah, one. Stage one. At, the, at the early nineties, let me set the scene. We had, yeah. um, just, you see, like your, your mixer board yeah. here. We had a little uh, four track recorder. Mm-hmm. This was um, in New Achimota, no, uh, wow. Petroleum. Okay. And um, I had a house there, beautiful place. And then we had set up a studio in the garage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So in the garage, we had our, our four track. We had a little, um, I believe it was a Korg keyboard and mm. um, an Amiga computer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those like times. A, a, Amiga, when you say Am- Amiga, it was, um, you know, you had those days, you had Atari. Okay. And you had Amiga. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and, okay, and yeah, they yeah. were like little, little things. And you mm-hmm. had to connect it to a normal yeah, TV yeah, and all that. Yeah, and it yeah. had um, one of the rudimentary um those days we called them sequences. Yeah. They, they were not called doors, DAWs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it had a little sequencer and it was actually graphically represented. So every note had the time, the the notes, the value. Mm. And the, so it was actually literally lines. It was like an Excel spreadsheet. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that was before Work. the days of graphics. Yeah, there were yeah, no yeah, graphics yeah. those yeah. days. And then we had a, 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 a four track tape recorder, mm-hmm. which could literally f- record four tracks at yeah, a time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you had to be bouncing tracks. If you wanted to do lots of vocals you have to mm. bounce uh, three tracks into one and, and and it was it was complicated mm. but the studio session i remember would be um in fact two two artists one would be kiki jan oh you wow you Sibisa, yeah. i i i i never knew this yeah yeah kiki jan actually stayed with us for for about uh, three months about three months he was oh, living wow. with us yeah in in Yuachimota. and then um atongo Oh, shout out mm-hmm. to Atongo. Yeah, yeah, my guy. Atongo. So yeah. he, he used to come over and we'll record mm. um, his, his, his track. So th- those were the two, the two uh, sessions back then that I remember, you mm. know, vividly, because they, they were the, the two most prominent artists that would be working with us yeah. in the studio. And th- those times it was just fun. We were not, I mean, mm. there was nothing like money or charging or anything like that. We were just jamming together and having, having fun. Mm. Um, and then... Um, at that time, we actually performed at the very first Panafest. Oh, that wow. Time, at that time, it was called Pafam. 92? 92. Oh. I- Independence Square. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's actually how I met uh, my main, main man, Rush. Oh, um, okay. So okay. I was performing. We are coming to Rush. Like, we, are, <laughs> we, we have to drill you about Rush right, today. Right. Because, Fred, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you. No Rush problem. is... One guy I never ever like. I'm um, when you see Rush, you see DKB. Like the last time I saw Rush, <laughs> DKB wasn't there, and and I was lo- looking looking at him weird. <laughs> like you know, because anytime you see Rush, it's DKB, and they run several decades deep. So I think we should tap into that and know the intricacies. Like like why? Like you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so yes. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um. Since I had a slot to, p- to perform on, yeah. on that, and that was, I mean, it was special. We had Public Enemy, yeah. Dion Warwick, yeah. Isaac Hayes, yeah. um, Jermaine Jackson, mm. and all of that. They, I mean, on stage, you see the thing. So, and obviously Lumba and Kodju yeah. Entry yeah. and, yeah. and Amachi Dede, all of, all of that were on stage, Independent Square. And it was a huge setup, huge mm. setup, and it was packed. So I, I wanted to get it right. So I needed yeah. dancers. You know, it was, a, it was a dance tune that, that we were performing. Um, so I needed dancers. So um, I was looking around. And I don't know if you know Jimmy. Um, Jimmy had a jazz club in Tessano way back in the early 90s. Mm. Um, mm. And uh, he's, he's one of the best saxophonists um, oh. in, uh, around. Um, he's a, a mixed race guy. I don't know if mm. you know him. No. He, now he'll be in his, um, probably in his late 60s. So he had a jazz club. And I used to sing there. So I told him one day, I need, I need some dancers. So he arranged and then we met. And then Rush was, was one of the main, the main dancers in, in the group. 
So, uh, um, Rush, yeah. Oh, Rush, is, <laughs> he's actually a dancer. <laughs> the way Rush bore when yeah. the dance, <laughs> no, back, he always bore back then, yeah. uh, back then, six pack, and, you know, and all that. Seriously, oh, yeah. so he, he was one of the, the best members of the, of the group. So, mm. we, you know, so we rehearsed for about I think about three, four months before the show. So, we were always together, and then we realized that we had other um cross points if you like mm. so he he had actually had a, a technical background um doing telecommunications mm. he was very good with electronics and um obviously i was also into it yeah and um at that time i just opened a, a computer school i remember these were before the days of the internet yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, there was yeah. nothing like the internet in in ghana even even outside it wasn't really a thing the internet was not a thing at that, yeah. at that point so um i just opened a school because that was one of the things, um, you know, coming to Ghana. And, and at that time, I was just, um, I think at that time, 18 years old. Mm. I just turned 18. Wow. And, um, 18. And you had a school. Yeah, yeah. So we, mm. we set up a school uh, not far from here, actually, an mm. industrial area. And um, so when I realized that, that Rush was also into electronics, then I brought him into head our hardware section. So he was teaching hardware. In terms mm. of how to how to repair computers, how to build computers, and all of that telecommunications and, and things, so we we kind of had uh, you know different areas where we where we we crossed. Mm. So mm. so that that's one of the reasons why we ended so, up. Um, so yeah. Atongo and um, you mentioned you, you gave you gave me Kiki Jan Kiki Jan yeah Kiki Jan Kiki Jan I I knew <clears throat> in his last days because yeah. he was coming yeah. to Kanishi Sports Complex. Every mm -hmm. now and then to watch mm -hmm. us play basketball, and we became friends. And so, yeah. you know, he passed. May he, mm. may he rest in peace. Yeah. And I, 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 I honestly feel you have lived life. Would you agree? I, I guess so. Yeah, I guess. So. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm saying this because you were doing things that we all wish. You know, we, like we all wish that, you know, mm -hmm. that was us. That like, <laughs> that guy should be us. That guy should be us. Like you were right. on TV at a very young age. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. like I knew you, my family knew who you were. You were, and, and, and all that. Mm -hmm. Is it like Fred, like usually, mm. right? So this morning I, 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 I was thinking about this episode and I, and I, and I was thinking about luck fate you know is it is it luck fate you know and all for because for someone to be consistent in my face throughout the years because back then when i was watching david on tv i never knew that i would meet someone who would be so close to him shouts to mensa and sabonzi who would be so close to him and so david has been in my face like throughout the years i have subscribed to his channel so I see your videos, okay, and okay. and all. So you have been in my face, you know, through and through, like a staple. Yeah, mm. like like like. Is this what you wanted? Wow, that's a deep question. Um, and I, and mm. I'm sorry, and I'm asking this because <laughs> yeah, you are. And, and I've told Mensa, Mensa this. I feel David is too calm to be like you know. David is so <laughs> calm, like very, very calm. Because I, I'm, I've never seen watch David and I and gone like, no, that, that guy is mad or angry. Like you know, David would engage no matter the topic. Like he would engage and all that. Like his personality is what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So is this? What you wanted? That's that's a, a difficult question to really mm -hmm. answer. Um, I always say that it is what it is, yeah. right? Yeah. What has happened has happened, and I'm not one to look back mm -hmm. and try to. Even though my brain is always trying to take me there, yeah, and try to overanalyze what I did right what i did wrong and all of that but um maybe if i take you back mm -hmm. a little bit further um it will it will kind of make sense when i answer that um you know i i was born in the uk mm -hmm. 
Yeah, to a Scottish father and a Ghanaian mother. And my mum left Ghana in the uh, mid 60s, mm. just around the time of the Nkrumah overthrow. Mm. Yeah, and she had a very bad um, experience of Ghana. So in her mind, um, Ghana was a no no. She didn't want her children to come back to Ghana. Um, so she was kind of happy that we were there. Mm. Uh, my dad was very, very strict, extremely strict. Um, the sort of father that would make you do your homework five times over. <laughs> mm. Literally. I mean, what would happen is straight from school, he'll sit you down at the dining table. You'll finish your homework. Then he'll set you additional work to do. Wow. And I, I, I have it still vividly in my yeah, mind. Yeah, my, yeah. my friends would come knocking on the door that, you know, can David come out to play? He said, no, no, no. He's, he's doing his homework. So that, that was my upbringing. Mm. Very, very strict, um, but also very, very loving. What, was, yeah. what, what did he do? My dad did absolutely everything. Okay. Absolutely everything. I mean, he, he, he had been a soldier in, in, um, in Malta, the UK, the UK uh, um, or British at that time, British, uh, British Army. He had been a, a, a bus driver, a heavy goods driver. He had been a tailor. Mm. He had been a builder, electrician, plumber. Wow. Um, absolutely everything. Um, his, his father was a quantity surveyor. Okay. So basically what they did is all, all of his children went through all the disciplines. So my dad could literally do anything. He'd build a house, he could wire it, he could plumb it, you know, finish it off, paint it, do everything. So my dad, um, I guess you call it what, jack of all trades, basically. Yeah. Mm. yeah? But he was a master of them all as well. That, that's the thing. So, mm. um, but the time I came around, he was a tailor working in a psychiatric hospital. So he was wow. making the... The, the clothing for the for the patients. Wow. Yeah, for the for the, the you know the, the the patients or the inmates. And my mother was a nurse also in the psychiatric hospital. And that's how they met in, in the UK. Mm. So um yeah, so I grew up in that very loving environment. Um, but very, very strict as well. Um so and and the other thing that is 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 still difficult for me to talk about. Um I because um my dad was white my mom was black, mm -hmm. right? In the UK, this, remember, this was the um, late 70s yeah, getting to the yeah. early 80s. Yeah. I was black, basically. I was actually coming to that, yeah. yeah I yeah. was black, and, and I still am. If I yeah. go to the UK, I'm still black. Yeah. But, but here, you but are here, not black. here, I'm white. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's, right. oh, it's, yeah. it's a paradox. I yeah. never, I never get over. So um, I was the only black kid in my primary school. I was one of two black kids in my secondary school. Wow. Yeah. So because we were living outside of central London, mm -hmm. we were in, in Surrey, which was kind oh, of okay. um, an affluent area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even though my parents were not affluent. Mm. So, uh, so we were, I, was, I was kind of in this very odd position. Yeah. So where, where I was always outside. Yeah. And um, I had friends that could just turn on me at any point mm. and then call me a monkey. Mm. You see the thing? So it, it's like you're, you're constantly insecure about, yeah, about your yeah. position of who you are and yeah. all of that. So I think that's what drove me to prove that I was up to it. You know, that, that I, I, you know, maybe I wanted to have some kind of acceptance. Maybe I wanted to show them all that, you know, I, I, I was... You, you, were, you were the G. You could do it. Yeah, that I could do it. Not, yeah. not even that I was better than them, but mm -hmm. that I could do what they were doing. You yeah, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. So Validation. Exactly, yeah. 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 So, you know, we, we're all social beings and we, we all want to feel like we belong. You sort of thing, to, 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 to a large degree. So I think that that's what sparked my, my drive and the fact that my father also made sure that he drove that education into me, mm -hmm. literally, you see the thing. So at a very young age, um, he bought me my first computer when I was nine. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, this, uh, this was when, like, do you remember uh, the year? Nine, so I was born in 73, so that, that would be 81. Mm. Yeah, that was my first computer. That was when, when, when I was born. <laughs> yeah, I will come a year later, but... Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. So. Shouts to the Gen Zs too. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. Wow, so yeah. 81, you had your first computer. Had my first computer, yeah. And it was... Um, it had, um, in, in fact, it was an upgraded computer that had four kilobytes of memory. 
and it's been upgraded to 16 kilobytes. Not megabytes, not gigabytes, not terabytes. Kilobytes. 16 yeah. kilobytes. Yeah. Right? I don't know how, if you understand yeah, how small... You can't even me me measure, yeah. measure it now. You can't take a picture. Yeah, yeah. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't take a picture. Like, a picture is like 15 megabytes plus. Uh-huh. Wow. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 So it has 16 kilobytes of memory. Wow. And it had a... If you wanted to load or save something, you had to use a cassette. Right, wow. so to, to load those 16 kilobytes, not, not floppy. Oh, that was before floppy time. Wow, that was way before floppy. Um, so 16 kilobytes, and to load that 16 kilobytes from cassette will take about 25 30 minutes, and to save it Jeez. the same amount of time. And if that cassette has any problem, if it gets you know, <laughs> yeah. torn or twisted or... You that's know, it. That's it. You've lost everything. Wow. You've lost everything. Um, so, yeah, so that was it. So I started out basically... Um, those times they were magazines. Every yeah. month there will be a magazine. And it will come with a cassette. Yeah, so that cassette you could load it and it will either have a game on it. Mm. And it was black and white or... It was a black oh, and white wow. computer. Yeah, there yeah, was no yeah. color. Those yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't a color computer. Yeah. Even though it, there was color TV, it was not at that point that you had the color computer. Yeah, that yeah. was an upgraded machine that came mm. a few years later. So um, you would basically have to then take this, this magazine and then type, apart from the, what came on the cassette, you would type pages and pages of code. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. It was Forget a about it. Yeah, it was a game. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Wow. <laughs> so maybe it was a game. And that yeah. game will be a very basic game, but it will come on maybe 10 pages of, of, uh, of, of, page of paper on the magazine. And you'd literally have to type hundreds and hundreds of lines of code. Now, to, wow. to give you an idea, 16 kilobytes those days could take about eight A4 sheets of paper in terms of the typing. Mm. Yeah, an average A4 sheet is about two kilobytes. Obviously, wow. that's just text, no, no pictures or anything like that. So you would type it, and invariably you would make so many mistakes because there will be typos on the magazine. You, you will also make your own typos, and then um, you know, there will be issues. So mm. um, you would have to then work out what the problems were mm. and fix it. So you can imagine the, the delight you would have when you manage to fix it and it's actually yeah, working, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which could take days. <laughs> so wow. that's how I learned how to code. Mm. And then I just continued, and my father was, um, oh, the computer that he got me was not a brand new computer, because he couldn't used. afford a new computer, yeah. it was a used computer. Yeah, it wow. was a used computer. So every computer I had was a used computer, until I was probably about 14 or 15, mm. when things started getting getting serious. So serious, yeah. yeah. So, so, so um, it wasn't a brand new computer, it was a used computer. So mm -hmm. obviously your father couldn't afford a new computer. No. So no. why did he decide to live in an affluent, you know, hood or, you know, It wasn't area. a decision. You know, in the UK, we have um, what we call council housing. Yeah. Can't, yeah. yeah. So mm. those days they had council estates. Yeah. Okay. And basically that was where we ended up. You see the thing. He had come from Scotland mm -hmm. to to London. Oh, okay. You see the thing, and that that was that's just where we happened to be. That the 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 authorities, the, the council, you know, or the government, put us in that block of flats, oh, okay. and it happened okay. to be there. Oh, okay. You see the okay. thing. So okay. it wasn't a decision that mm -hmm. we made. Oh, let's move to this rich yeah, area. Be, be because am I am I have friends or I've known people who intentionally go and live in the East Legons and mm, wherever mm, mm. so their kids could yeah. be friends with, you know, these rich kids and eventually once they grow up, <laughs> you know, life is <laughs> right, life, right. life like so I so I, was, so I, I don't know if it saying. guarantees anything. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. what I'm I'm curious about is the the process you are describing, having to code mm -hmm. to be able to enjoy the game. Right. Because the final goal was to get to the game, but you had to go through this yeah, process. Yeah. But then you just said, um, if there were mistakes, you had to work it out, correct them, mm -hmm. and you have all this joy if you're able to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. What was the process of correcting it? How did you know what to do to correct it? Um, you know, the thing about coding, and I guess anything in life, 
it's it's about breaking it down into its basic components. You sort of think when you have a problem and you see it as such so huge, I mean on the face of it it seems like a huge problem. But then when you realize, ah, but if I deal with this part first, then I can deal with the next part. And then before you realize it, you take it in small steps. So there was no guide for if no, no, you no, screw no. it up. No, 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 no. How there to no figure guide. it out. There was no guide. You you had to figure that out yourself. And that that's life. You have to figure it out yourself. <laughs> you see the thing. I'm quite curious about that because I'm trying to imagine in your mind at that age where you have, you know, a technical problem mm -hmm. of coding and then having to somehow think through where the error was coming from and to go back and fix it. Mm -hmm. When the page is, Emmanuel is telling you this is do A, B, C, you finish doing yeah. it, but you realize that things not working properly. Uh, maybe because I'm not a tech person. Mm -hmm. But my mind is finding a challenge to wrap around, oh, how do I go back? What do I change? How, why do I move this? Or what's the reason you do what you do? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, for me, it's, it's exactly the same process with music. Okay. Right? You, you, you hear something. So in your mind with music, you know, I want it to sound like this. But it's not sounding like that. And why is it not sounding like that? And sometimes it can be so confusing. It can be 10 little things that are contributing to create the sound that's happening right now. But you know you want the sound to be different. So you have to say, okay, fine, let me try this. In, in today's terms, it'll be, okay, let me try this plugin. Let me fix this EQ. Mm. Let me fix this reverb. Maybe instead of a plate reverb, I want a re room reverb. Maybe instead of saturation, um, with this type of saturation, I want something else. You hear me? So there, there, there are so many things. But it's, it's once you understand the individual components of something, Right. It's the same thing if you're a mechanic, you know, and there's a problem with a car. You have to take it piece by piece by piece, break it down into its components. Okay, the, the, the engine is not starting. What can cause that? You know, is, mm. it, is it my electrical system? Is it my fuel system? Is it my, my air intake, my oxygen? You know, is it, is it a mechanical problem? And then you break it down and test each individual component until you realize what's causing it. Right. It may be five issues. And then, but each time you, you fix one issue, another issue kind of blooms and then you realize, okay, this is now the issue. You fix that. And it gets to a point where you fixed everything and then it does what you want it to do. Right, right. You understand? So yeah. whether it's coding, mm. whether it's building a house, whether it's um, fixing a car, whether it's making music, uh, whether it's art, you sort of thing. It, it, it's all about breaking it down into its, its individual constituent parts. And then, then you know, resolve, resolving the, the, the problems, yeah. Dope. So uh, our, our, our point, so you were in the UK, you know, doing, you know, dope stuff. Then you came to Ghana. At what point did you come to Ghana and why did you come to Ghana? That's a because question I, I ask myself every day. Ghana, <laughs> why Ghana, did I come here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Ghana is now like I would never ever come to Ghana if, oh God. Hmm. if you know, am I? I could live in the UK. Like, yeah, yeah, nah. yeah. Yeah. So, so, hmm. at what point and why did you come to Ghana? Okay, so um, the fact that I never really fit in, even though I was extremely successful in the UK, right? By the time I was fifteen. I had my own offices. I was employing staff. Fred. I had, I had mm. cars. Um, I had a Porsche. I really want to ask him about all that. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. At yeah. the time I was 15, I bought a Porsche. I couldn't hey, drive hey, it. Hey, hey. Wow. <laughs> you know, and I'm not a materialistic person. So buying that Porsche was for a very specific reason. Because you, you realize that in, in this world we live in. At 15, you couldn't drive? I couldn't drive. So I, I ha actually had a business manager that I employed and one of his responsibilities was to drive me to my business meetings and, and, and all 15. of that. At 15? At 15, yeah. 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 Uh, so, that's incredible, man. So, um, basically, yeah. So, at that point, um, then it got to a point where um, our family doctor, because my father, uh, he was doing absolutely everything he could. He was upgrading the computers whenever he could. But it got to a point where it was just too much for him to handle. You know, mm. the, the computers then, there's no way he could, he could afford a computer for £5,000 back then. You sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, uh, fortunately, our family doctor, who had been our doctor since I was maybe five years old, 
had seen the development and he was supporting this other thing um, dr smith may may his soul rest in peace mm. um, so he i mean without him i simply wouldn't be here today um, but he he supported me so helped me with the financing computers um, all sorts of things you know if there were travel issues um, investments and so on he had um, he was uh, also his father was an investment banker mm. so he was very very wealthy you know it was that's generational wealth he had. yeah um, so he he also brought on his peers to invest into my business mm -hmm. so they were like angel investors back then when I was about 15 and then he suggested that look okay the government at that point this was um around 1988 the okay. government was changing the whole national health system they were trying to run it more like a business this was uh the time of margaret thatcher mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and i only did. yeah yeah <laughs> who who i actually got to meet and had, oh, a, wow. had a commendation oh. from from her back then um but um he said uh, now is a perfect opportunity to create um software that can help the doctors manage their surgeries like a business mm. right so this software had to do things like obviously how to have a register of all of your patients mm. or your clients as, as they are called now i guess uh, all of your patients so maybe the average um doctor surgery a general practitioner in the uk in those days would have maybe five thousand uh patients mm -hmm. in in their community so they had to be able to register all of them they had to be able to know how many were female within mm. a particular age, ra age range because the government were then looking at um, giving specific targets and they were starting to look at preventative preventative mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. medicine mm -hmm. so at those times for instance cervical cancer was a huge thing mm. so they realized that if they can screen and do cervical smears early they can catch cancer and 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 save a lot yeah. of lives and save a lot of money in for the the national health service system so the system would have to be able to track all of the females within this range track whether they've had a cervical smear if they hadn't had to be able to make appointments for them mm -hmm. send letters to them there were no emails in these days yeah, those yeah. days mm -hmm. yeah there's nothing like email system. you actually had to write so the print the system had to print the letter yeah, yeah. which would then be sent out to the to the to the patients it would have to carry a full history of their their medical records you would have to have a full disease register every single disease mm. in the world or that had been identified it would have to have that coded it would have to have complete drug database every single drug that had been developed and was being prescribed mm -hmm. um, and then looking at interactions between drugs that if you prescribe somebody amoxicillin and maybe penicillin I've forgotten the details now, but mm, you know, yeah. I, used to, I used to have it all in my head yeah. because I actually had to physically type the entire uh, Royal College of General Practitioners disease index, with, and there were thousands of pages. Yeah, you, you, have to, you, you, you had to type. I had to type physically because mm. you couldn't, there was no scanning, it didn't exist. Yeah. You had to type it. I had to type the, the actual drug dictionary into the, mm. into the system, you know, and then encode it and then list the interactions between drugs. And, and I was still in school. I was still in secondary school at this point. Um, yeah. I was about to, about to write my, my GCSEs mm. at, the, at, the, at that point. So I had to then develop this whole system. And then because my doctor was involved, he managed to get it certified by the Royal College of General Practitioners. Mm. So it became a certified system. Yeah. And then I started selling it. And those days, I remember it was um, $5,000, sorry, 5,000 pounds for an installation. This was in 1980. Wow. By that time, it was 1990. Because it okay. took about, it took up almost two years to develop the, 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 the system. So wait, I, I'm times. trying to dig deep. So how mm -hmm. many systems did you install? I'm this? coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> Five thousand, Fred. Yeah. You, for you for keep keep up. So so we so we do the calculation <laughs> and analyze. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, we ended up selling, I think, about. 350 Jesus Christ like that. So <laughs> was, <laughs> so, Wow So it was, it was well over a million pounds back then back then but wow. um, but the more interesting fact is that um, those days I had one major competitor there was a, a pharmaceutical company 
in those days it was called Siba, Siba Geigi. Siba Geigi. Yeah. They, they, it was the German pharmaceutical. Uh, I think they merged with, or Pfizer bought them out mm. at one point. So they, they don't exist anymore. But they had a similar system that did basically exactly what mine did. Theirs was selling at 250,000 pounds. Jesus wow. Christ. Did they try yeah. buying you out? They did. They did. <laughs> so, so, wow. Yeah. So at that time, I'd become quite a celebrity in the UK. I mean, I was on TV every week. I was on radio. This is like he was 15. 15 at, at that time, I was 16. Okay. At that time, I was 16, getting to, to 17. And um, so my dad, and obviously, I was, I was a minor. Mm -hmm. I was a minor. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so I couldn't legally... You were illegal. Yeah, legally, <laughs> I couldn't do anything. So my father was very much in the picture mm -hmm. and in control. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Even though I had a business manager as well. Um, but basically, what happened is they called... Um, I believe it was a business manager who told my father. This, this drug company had called us. They sent, that was my first time in a limousine. They sent mm. a limousine. This, this was 1990. They sent a limousine to my house, picked up my father and I, drove us about two hours. Uh, we were living in Surrey, yeah. which is kind of a, you yeah, know, yeah. a very ex expensive part of, yep. part of the country. They drove us further out into Surrey to some country mansion, which happened to be their retreat. That, that's where they, they go on their retreats. They owned it. Mm. I mean, it was in about, it was huge. I mean, the drive, you know, those, those movies where you see those huge driveways, yeah, yeah. the gates were open and you have to yeah. drive like a mile yeah, to get to that. To get it, to was, it was literally <laughs> yeah. like that. Got there. I mean, they, they showed us around, showed us their, their, their systems and everything. And it was impressive. It was really impressive. Mm. So then at the end of it, um, then they, they wanted me to show me to show them mine. So I, I, I had my, my laptop those, and that laptop was like this. It was and bulky. It, it wasn't a laptop. It was, <laughs> it, it was something else. Dumbbells. Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. So I showed them and then they're like, wow. Then they realized that it did basically whatever theirs did. I, I'd managed to simplify it mm. and broken it down to a point where I could sell it for 5,000 pounds. And that was including the computer. The computer at that wow. time was about 2,000 pounds or 2,500. The software wow. is about 2,500. So, and they're selling this for two, 250,000 pounds for one installation. You see the thing? So I was a threat and I was getting all the publicity because yeah. I was on TV and all of that. And the doctors were coming to me. Yeah. So it was destroying their, their business. Their business, yeah. So they, I, I quite remember it was a, Typical like board, you see like Jay-Z when they mm, sign a record mm. deal kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, they yeah. all there and then they, they actually wrote down um, a figure on, a, you know, this post-it notes. And yeah. Slid it over to my dad. And my dad um, looked at me and he, he shook his head like this. Two million pounds is what they, they had offered. So, um, uh, so he, he shook his head in disbelief, basically. Two million wow. pounds. Yeah, yeah. Two million pounds. Sixteen. Sixteen. So they, they wanted to buy it off of me for two million pounds at that point. Um, so I Jesus asked, Christ. I was very naive at those days because I was not, bear in mind, I was not doing any of this for money. Yeah. The money was coming all right, but I, I enjoyed what I was doing. You see the thing? It wasn't, it wasn't for cash. And, and that kind of holds true even to today to a, to a large extent to my, to my downfall, but that's another subject. Mm -hmm. But um, they, I asked naively, so why do you need my software when you already have yours? What are you going to do with mine? They said, oh, we'll shelve it because it is in direct competition <laughs> to what we have. You are impeding our progress. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, they said it plainly. to 5K. You're basically yeah. like oh, yeah, yeah. killing them. You're killing them, yeah. 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 You see the thing, and they, 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 you know, the doctors were essentially having to mortgage themselves to buy this software, yeah. which was compulsory for them to have because they couldn't run their surgeries without this software. You see the thing. I mean, just think about it. A software which is which, which is gonna manage your whole your medical records, your drug interactions, your diseases, everything, Crazy. your your scheduling appointments, all of that. So um, when that happened, I remember we, we said, okay, we'll get back to you. And I remember on the way back, my dad said, don't do it. 
Why? Do it. That was two million pounds. Yeah, but um, it wasn't about the money. You see the thing? It was Is your dad still around? No, no. He passed away 2019. He made it to uh, almost 90. He was 89. Oh, wow. 89. Oh, yeah, yeah. wow. Shout, shout, yeah, shout. Yeah, he did well. Rest in peace. Yeah. Did wow. Well. So, <laughs> two million pounds at 16. Mm-hmm. Hmm. You, you know what? That's actually giving me Kiki Chan vibes, you know, because, mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. now I'm seeing how you guys, you made him stay with you for three months and all that because right. Kiki Chan too was making money at a very young age. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. two million pounds. So, like, like you were, you were being like everybody wanted you, like you were everywhere. Mm-hmm. On TV, mm-hmm. in print, mm-hmm. on yeah. radio, yeah. I, yeah. I assume. So why did you like move from the UK mm. to Ghana? So like Ghana. <laughs> what happened after after rejecting the two million pounds? Yeah. I got extremely busy selling the, the, software. the software to for five thousand. Yeah, 5, 000, for five thousand to so many doctors, and we had employees, we had marketing people, salespeople, and all of that. So it started to grow as an operation. Mm. We had offices and and. You know, it, it was it was an exciting time. Then um, I was still doing the TV interviews, and mm. I did one particular interview, which was um, there was this show called TV AM, which is a, a breakfast show. That that was a new thing back then, having a breakfast show because TVs didn't start until like nine yeah. nine going, but this started around six AM. Remember when TV actually used to have a starting time and yeah, a closing yeah, yeah, time, yeah. like uh-huh. TV was reflections, yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, like, reflections like on that. GT. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was like yeah. that. So TV AM was like. The new thing, yeah. they start at, I think, 6 a.m., they close yeah. at 9, and then normal TV starts. So they invited me on to, on to TV AM for an interview. And I believe that was the first time I mentioned that my mother was Ghanaian. Mm. You see the thing? Um, because up to that point, it was always my dad, my dad, my dad, my dad. And I mentioned my mother was Ghanaian. The next, I think it was either the same day or next day, I got a call from... The British, from the Ghana High Commission in, in Britain. That, we are um, coming to take they, uh, <laughs> our belonging. <laughs> they said, oh, they, they're inviting us to come and come and yeah. And my dad loved Ghana. Oh. He was here, or any opportunity he used to come to Ghana. Yeah. Yeah, my mum hated it, <laughs> right? Even though we used to come on a couple of holidays, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. when I was young. But she, she still had bad memories of Ghana. Bad my dad well. absolutely loved it, you know. Um, so when they invited us over, the, the high commissioner, at that time, I think it was KB Annan. I think he was the mm. high commissioner. I think he's also passed away. But uh, this was during the PNDC days with mm, uh, Cham- yeah. Chairman Rollins. So, Charles, Charles. Yeah, Chairman Rollins. Mm. So um, got there and they said, oh, they've taken note. And at that point, there was also um, a reporter there from West Africa magazine. West okay. Africa magazine was a huge magazine yeah, 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 back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Back then. So they interviewed me and then that that also came out. And then um from there had another call from the high commission saying, Look, Chairman Rollins uh wants you to come and serve your country. What did your mom say? No. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to mom. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Prius, uh-huh. my son is not going. Yeah, no. <laughs> wow. You see, the other, the other aspect was that from the time I was about seven years old, I, my mama told me that if I come to Ghana, um, I will be made a chief. So that, that was also oh. something that she did not want to happen. She did mm. not want to happen. She was a royal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. From, um, we're from a, a town called Otwam, Ekumfi. Which yeah. is where yes. uh, the late, central region, yeah, yeah. yeah, where the late president Atta Mills mm. um, also came from. Wait, so your mom, mommy didn't want her son to be a chief. a chief, yeah, yeah. So, so we can say that's basically why she was trying to take everybody far away. That was one of the issues. The second issue was that she said, look, Ghana, you will never see your true potential. That I agree. Yeah. That, that, that's a big that one. That I agree. Yeah. Yeah. That said, I agree. She said that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She said that you will never see your true potential. 
And um, she's right. She she was right. And yeah. You know, she was right. But then it is what it is. Is she so still around? Yeah, yeah. She okay. is. Oh, awesome. wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, she, is she here? She's in. Oh, but. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> she's in London. She's in, she's in London. <laughs> she's in London. Oh, There's, wow. So yeah. it was deep. Like she's not coming back. No, she's not coming back. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly trying to get her to come back. I managed to get her here when my dad passed in, 19, in 2019. Um, I managed to bring her here for a couple of months. And she's gone back, and then COVID happened. Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm, I just got back a couple of weeks ago. I spent a week with her. Oh, okay. And um, asked her, so will you come back? And she's like, "There's no money. There's no money." <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, How you old know. is she? Uh, now she's seventy. Uh, oh, wow. She'll oh. be seventy-four this year. Oh, okay. Oh, seventy-four this mm-hmm. year, but she's still going very yeah, strong. Yeah. That's awesome. Very strong. Yeah, no. yeah. So, so, did did you ever reflect on the similarity of your lineage with Rollins? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I was forced to. When, when he actually, when he invited me, and then my father was all for it because mm. he loved Ghana. I mean, there's something about, about Ghana he loved. I think it was the, the, the women. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. OG, yeah. OG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. My dad was prolific. Yeah, so my, my dad, uh, he was all for it. And so and my, my dad was very dominant. In, in, mm. in the household. So whatever he said went. I mean, he was your typical Scottish yeah. authoritarian. A man's man, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, yeah. When, when, when he put on that, that stern voice, everybody in the house listens. You, yeah. know, you, you don't question. You don't question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he was all for it. So, boom, we, we came and uh, landed at Kotoka. Ghana Airways was still in existence. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. was 1990, November First, 1990. I still remember it very well. Mm. Ghana Airways was delayed 18 hours. <laughs> so we were sitting in Heathrow Airport for 18 hours. Apparently, they had engine trouble and all mm. of that. So we, we were supposed to arrive on the first, um, I believe, in the morning. We ended up arriving the following morning around 2 a.m. It had just been pouring with rain. Mm. Um, I got, got to Ghana, hit by that wall of heat. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you know, and then whisk through VIP and all of that. Oh wow! Came out. So that means you had like you. Yeah, were, the president. He was here yeah, on the president's yeah. invitation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were reporters to. there, and they had been oh. reporting for a couple of weeks before that the computer whiz kid is visiting Ghana and, and all of that. They had arranged a full schedule for me. Mm. Uh, so I arrived at two a.m. at at Kotoka. Came out of VIP. And there were about 500 people waiting for me. Wow. It had rained heavily. Wow. 2 a.m. Um, wait, were there, were there dramas and, you know, dancers? You know that thing that, uh, that, that yeah, they yeah. do. <laughs> no, I, actually, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't recall that. So it was packed with that, reporters. It was packed, packed with people, people and reporters, yeah. From the cabinet, I... I um, know? I remember, I think P.V. O'Bain was there. Yeah, okay, yeah P.V. Okay, O'Bain, yeah. that's that I P.V. remember. P.V. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, but Being the rest, I don't, honestly, I don't remember who mm-hmm. else was there at that time. But, I mean, just general members of the public, and then more specifically, my family members, from right, here. from yeah. here. And that was what hit me first. The first, and then I was whisked straight to my hometown wow, to be wow. installed as a chief. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. just like your mom was fearing. Yeah, she was right. I mean, she she knew it. So Wait, you know how you know how they install chiefs, right? So, at my last nine to five, they a guy there was a royal, and one time we are work, mm-hmm. and his people just came in. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Came to like <laughs> yeah. do some right, pour libation, pour like like do so, all sort of things, and they. They whisk them away. They kidnap you, basically. Yeah. They yeah. Kidnap you, yeah. 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 So it was the, the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, uh, there was a question that was asked. Are you willing to do it? And I was like, what? And my dad said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was all. I remember, I remember the trip from Kotokat all the way to my hometown and the road was bad. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I can't remember. Those wow. days, that was before the road was, yeah, was, yeah, was yeah. redone and all of that. The road was bad. And I hadn't experienced potholes and all that. Got to my hometown. Bougie. You were bougie. <laughs> well, even in my poverty, yeah. poverty stricken state in the UK, I was yeah. still bougie in, in comparison. Yeah. There was no electricity in my hometown at that time. It didn't exist. Electricity wow. hadn't reached there. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, electrification. That, you see, that's why sometimes we have to accept that Ghana has come a long way in the last 30 years. Of course. In, in a lot of areas. Ghana has really come a long way. Um, there was no electricity. Yeah. There was no water. No pipe-borne water. There was no well, nothing. Mm. You see the thing? So there was a stream, basically, and that was where the water was, was collected. You see the thing? So they, they had actually brought water from Accra for me, <laughs> <laughs> which... Even even that water, living the life. Even that water, I was not used to it. So yeah, you can imagine yeah, yeah, yeah. arriving in a in a completely alien environment with no electricity, the heat which I was not used to, and then um, no water, and then I, the water I drank made me sick. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you get me. So it was it was like man, it was it was something else. But then. We, we got there on, I think it was on a Friday. The second was on a Friday. Mm. Um, so we got there and then the, they, because um, of the whole situation, they had to do a very shortened ceremony. You know, normally they lock you in a room yeah, yeah. and do all kinds all of rituals rights. and all of that. Yeah. So they had to do that as a very uh, abbreviated uh, version. So it was done over the weekend. I was carried on the palanquin and, and all of that. Installed Culture in shock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to swear my oath at the, you know, at, at, at the shrine. And, um, you know, there were various sacrifices made of sheep and chickens. And, man, you can imagine. I'm, I'm coming from... I've, I'd never seen a live chicken before, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I knew chicken drumsticks. I didn't know the whole animal. <laughs> Charles <laughs> Yeah. And then they were slashing chickens' necks and things and <laughs> sheep and things. Wow. And then the blood was just gushing. I the, thinking, the change <laughs> is so drastic. But you it know was, what I find interesting? Is that your dad, how yeah. he had he's not the Ghanaian. It's your mother's the Ghanaian. And then he yeah. was there, yeah. yeah. And he wanted this to yeah, yeah. happen. Yeah. Did you ever have a conversation with him about why? Why? Um Actually, I didn't. You know, I didn't. Wow. I didn't. It mm. was, you know, my father was somebody you did not question. Yeah. You did not question. So, uh, no, it was just, if he says it's A, it is A. You, you don't even want to understand there are other letters of the alphabet. Right. You understand? That, yeah. that, was the sort, that was the level of discipline. Mm. You see the thing? But I grew to appreciate that so much because it, it instilled... Um, a level of discipline in me and consistency that mm. I, I carry forward to, to the day. No, so I okay. respect it a lot, but I, I, I wish we could just get a peek into his mind of yeah, how he yeah. saw the world exactly, and exactly, why yeah. he made those yeah. decisions. But, yeah. Yeah. but before you go on, how yeah. are you with your kids? Uh, complete opposite. Okay. Complete opposite. Okay. I mean, I'm... I'm maybe why, 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 why though? Because um, I was never close to him. Because I couldn't ask him the why. You see the okay. thing? I didn't have that opportunity because um, the, the upbringing was so strict mm. that you dare not ask the why. Even as an adult, you see the thing? Yeah. You, you dare not ask the why. Uh, because he, he's, he was that old school father that yeah. if I say this, it is this. You don't question. But don't you think that if you questioned, that would have given you a leeway to do whatever you like, because because he was stern or firm or strict, hmm. you are who you are t today. You, you see the banku stick you have <laughs> yeah. there? If you questioned, that would be on your ass, <laughs> basically. Yeah, <laughs> you oh understand? wow. Yeah. That, 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 mm. That's how it was. You know, even though he was not a violent man by any means. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I think yeah. he actually, I, I just remember twice where he actually took a belt. You know, mm. first, first time I was caught smoking. And the second time, I, I've forgotten what it was, but that was mm. the, on, the only time he ever raised his hand, his yeah. hand to me, and, and, and I deserved it, you know. But just, just the, the tone of his voice in a, alone was enough yeah. to just keep you, you know, in, in your yeah. place. But yes, I, I agree that yeah. the discipline made me who I am today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So there, there are always two sides to every, yeah. to every, to every Be coin. Because me, I was living life, my life was on the right path, in quotes, and mm -hmm. my mom passed in 98 when I was, should I say my 17? Mm. Then my, my life flipped 
like I became like a total opposite. Like I always say, if my mom had lived to see me go through uni and all that, my life would have been totally different because mm. my mom, mm. like his dad, was a was strict. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I ha- I had to do stuff. I had to do things. Talking about chief, your you being a chief, you mm. being installed mm. as a chief chieftaincy. Were you made a chief? You know how in Ghana we have the inkoswahine, mm-hmm. like if you are <laughs> like well off, if, if if you are rich, wealthy, and you are from a town or a village in Ghana, they make you the inkoswahine because you have the money and you can see things go on in Kosovo, like mm-hmm. see things go on. Were you that kind of chief, or you were an actual chief? I'm actually, or you are. I'm actually uh, known. My my title is Nana Obatan. Mm. So essentially, I am the mother of the town yeah, of that yeah, of that yeah. whole area. So um, the previous Nana Obatan. So and my my uh, store name. Let me let me butcher the pronunciation, mm. but it's Akweku Chimano the sixth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that that's my my store name. So it's like a full yeah, know, chief, full, full lineage. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and the the my grand uncle who is the previous chief, the fifth, he actually. Um, abdicated for me mm. because he was um, he was at that time he was 80 something he was getting weak and all of that and he felt that that they needed fresh blood in mm. you know to 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 uh, you know to to take the town forward um, so so you know rightly or wrongly he he abdicated but fortunately whilst he was still alive I mean he man- he stayed around for another 10 years after that um, he was still helping me out, and because mm. look, I, I came from the UK, I had no yeah. idea, no mm. no idea of the traditions and and so on, you know. And even to today, I struggle with some of the traditions. Yeah, you know, we celebrated our stool our stool festival last year, and every year we have to do the sacrifices, and it's so bloody, you know. And I still can't deal mm. with it. Oh. I still can't deal with it. I mean, you, you walk in to the stool the stool room. And um, you know the sacrifices that have to be made, the the chickens and the sheep, and mm. it, it's not it's not pretty. It's That's not pretty. Lot. It's not pretty. That's yeah, yeah. But um, I've come to accept it as as it is. You know, yeah. it, it yeah. it's how it is. So yeah. so you still yeah. perform that role. You're yeah. still in your, your oh, yeah, chief yeah, yeah. 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 That's so, awesome. Yeah. So that means you have been a chief for over twenty years plus. Over thirty years. Thirty 90, years. Nineteen yeah, ninety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty three wow. years. Yeah. Wow. That means years. you have all the lands in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Fred, do your thing. Oh, and, and it happens to be beachfront land. It's oh beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. We, that's him. Yeah, we have to talk. Beautiful place. Yeah. So so um like um so a, a, a waste kid in Ghana, like and all that the first time I encountered you was on TV. I will never ever forget that mm-hmm. day because of my mm-hmm. mom and my grandma. Like Right in this house, like wow, okay, but yeah, 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 like mm-hmm. right in this house. Have you seen that? You, you know, have you seen that? You know, you have to right. be like you and, and all that. You became a staple, like you became a home, like, household like, name. yeah, you became a household name, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, how did it feel? Like, w- w- did you feel like a superstar ar- in and around Ghana? Not, not at all. I mean, the. I, I guess because I had had that level of publicity in the UK okay. already. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Um, look, I'd met the Prime Minister of the UK. I'd had John Major? No, that time, no. Margaret Thatcher. Okay, Margaret Thatcher. Thatcher, Thatcher, Thatcher. Thatcher yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'd had commendations from her. I'd, I was on TV all the mm. time. And, you know, I'm sure if I'd stayed there by now, maybe I'd have uh, an OBE or something. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. But here we are. Knighted. Yeah. You, you would exactly, have been knighted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, those times, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Alan Sugar. No. Alan Sugar was um, the Trump, um, sorry, the Musk rather, the Elon Musk mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. those times. Yeah. Alan, Alan Sugar had a company called Amstrad, mm. and they were manufacturing computers. Mm. And um, he even had this um, this uh, reality TV show, the one that Trump did in um, in America. Um, um. Apprentice, the, apprentice. The, apprentice. the Apprentice. It actually started in the UK. Oh, okay. So it was it was um, Alan Sugar that started that. Mm. America does that a lot. Takes UK. Shows yeah, yeah, they do. Mm. They do. So he was a, a billionaire, and he actually when when I was um, I believe fifteen, I wrote to him, telling him I'd done 
this, 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 and I want to do that. I wrote to him directly. Um, and then I still have that, that letter there. And then mm. he replied that, yes, he, he, he will help. So he actually sponsored me. You know, a multi-billion dollar company sponsored me with equipment, um, set me up and all of that. Wow. He said the thing. That, that, that was um, part of the, the sponsorship that helped me even... That was after I developed the medical system. Mm -hmm. And that, that was what en enabled me to get the offices, employ all the staff and, 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 and set up. So um, he was actually very disappointed to hear that I was coming to Ghana. Mm. And I he can said, imagine. Look, you're, you're throwing away everything, your life, basically. He said, I think Jeez. two people said that Alan Sugar and then my headmaster at my high school. Hmm. You see, that's sad because I was it? still in high school, remember, mm. at, the, at this point. And they said, You're throwing away your life to come to Ghana. Wow, you know, but, uh, but so, so looking back, would you do things differently? I always say no regrets, right? Because what has happened, happened. Nobody forced me to come, even though my dad, you know, if, if I had said that I'm not coming, there's no way he could have really, you know, and, um, you know, given that everything that was happening at that time, um, and that was obviously at the, the cusp of the internet. Yeah. You see, so if I had stayed, who knows? Who yeah. knows? Maybe, yeah. maybe, you know, it, things would be very, very different. How, uh, Fred, I, I, know, I know you want to ask a question, but how was your relationship with the late president of Ghana, um, Jerry John Rawlings? He was my father, basically. Did, did he just bring you here and just leave you? Or? No, 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 not at all. I mean, we, we right until, up until the day he died, we were, we were close. We were close. Um, the, and I guess that that's one main reason why I don't regret coming mm. here because I, I got to see a whole different value system in life. Mm. You understand that um, already I was not materially focused in the first place, mm. but I got to see that there's, there's so much more to life than making money, you sort of thing. And, and success can be measured in so many different ways. Uh, for mm. instance, when, when I came to Ghana and I met him, I remember the, uh, the castle. Um, those days, I had a, I had long hair. And yeah, I, yeah, I had a, yeah, had a pony, yeah, yeah, ponytail and all that. Yeah, my Jerry curls and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do remember. <laughs> so, so um, I was there in my suit, met him. I had my that same laptop, that huge laptop yeah. thing. And then I sat down with him with PV Bain and uh, GTV were there, and it was a huge thing. Yeah. And then I, I just I, I took out my medical system and explained it to him, mm -hmm. and he said. Ah, Nobody has ever explained technology to me like this where I could understand it. He said a thing. Very simplified. Very simplified. And, and that was one thing. Then he said, no, you have to stay. You have to stay. And then because of, I guess, partly because of the connection of having um, a Scottish father, Ghanaian yeah, mother. Yeah. And then also in the UK, I had been flying model aircraft. You know, the, the radio-controlled aircraft with petrol oh, wow. engines and all of that. I, I used and to have he a was in, into... And he was also, he was a jet fighter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Plus, he was flying the model aircraft. Oh, wow. So, he invited me over. After the initial publicity and all of that, he invited me over. And then we used to fly together, the, the model aircraft. Helicopters and Charlie fixed Fred. wing and all that. <laughs> yeah. so the the place we come to you for. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a different life? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I became literally like a son to him. He taught me how to fly a plane, real planes, taught me how to fly Crazy. real planes and military planes and all of that. I was flying all over with him. You know, almost every weekend we'll be flying to, you know, Akusumba, they actually yeah, have an yeah, airstrip yeah, there. Yeah. We we'll fly to Kumasi and that, then living the life. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we flew all over um, Abidjan and all sorts of, all sorts of places. And he taught me, I remember the first time I landed in Kotaka myself. And at that, that time, it was a, a military aircraft called a Defender. It's a twin-engine aircraft. It carries about 20 people. And, you know, that feeling of actually landing the, the aircraft, and, that, man, I was, I was shitting my pants, basically. <laughs> I mean, it, it, but, but he was so calm in the whole, you know, it's like, you can do it. He just left the controls. He was sitting to my, to my right. Just left the controls and told me, you do it. I landed wow. the aircraft, and it was, you know, that, that sense of accomplishment that, that, mm. I, that I had, 
you know so so um and then since you know from that point onwards um it got to the point where i I'll, I'll drive my i don't know if you know a lada niva it was a it was like a little four by four car yeah Lada. like a box like, like a box yeah, 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 that, yeah. Was, that was my car i used to do so i used to drive my neva straight into the castle they'll open the main gates they'll open the inner gates i just walked straight up past the the soldiers and this was this was pndc times or mm. military government times fred you have no idea yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh i do that's <laughs> so, in how crazy it was because yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's a different time different era yeah 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 so, two things i want to ask um something in a follow-up with like to what Mutombo was trying to drive at is if you could do it all over again, mm -hmm. would you do the same thing? For us, uh, from a distance, not being able to experience you like in close proximity, knowing what your life was, do you ever reflect on the impact mm -hmm. that your work has had on Ghanaian culture? And where do you place it in terms of so how I would pair, uh, compare it is, you were doing something very vital in the UK. Excuse me. At the cusp of the, uh, if you want to call it a revolution in the uh, medical field, transitioning to right. tech right. and all that. You were right there in the middle of it, developing software. So you were essential basically to a, a whole country's mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. And you get transposed into Ghana and... I think I would not be exaggerating if I say you were essential to the evolution of our culture, entertainment culture, and what have you. Do you ever sit back to reflect on that, given that question Mutombo asked? If you could do it all over again, would you mm. do it? That's, that's number one. Right. So if you hold that in your thought process. And I want to, I want, I've been wanting to ask a question since you started because I think young people who may find themselves in your shoes if they have the level of skill or intellect or whatever you want to describe it as. At 15, you had a, uh, you had hired a manager. What did you call them? Yeah, uh, and, uh, office. A business manager. Business manager. Yeah, yeah. And you were basically running a business where you had an office, employees, and for all intents and purposes, carrying yourself as a proper businessman. Mm -hmm. It would be good or informative to know how you knew what to do, whether you needed a business manager, all these things that you had to do, right into Alan Sugar and all of that. What was your aspiration at that time and what was your thought process? What was driving you to say, this is what I need to do, this is how I need to go about it? That's a very deep question. Um, in the first place, I... I want to say that I don't regret anything that has happened, right, um, in principle. But in reality, we all have regrets, you see. Right. And if you ask anybody in this world that if you have the chance to do it all over again, will you do it the same, right? And definitely you wouldn't, you see the thing. Given, given the experience you have now um, and the, the mistakes you have made along the way, the things that people have done to you and all of that, you would definitely do things differently. But I will say that, look, it has happened. Uh, at that point, given my experience, given my, my level of maturity, I made the best decision I could. Mm. Yeah, and, and purely that decision was made on, on a level that I felt I belonged in Ghana. Mm. Yeah, remember, no matter how successful I was in the UK, I was black. Yes. Right? So that, that can never be washed away with millions or billions of pounds. It can never be washed away. You will always be black. Things are a little bit different nowadays, but mm. not so much. I mean, if, even if you look at what's happened to Fuse OGG recently, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, where he's, he's been profiled, profiled, he's been arrested yeah. and all that. So things still... No, racism is still a real is yeah, still, still a real issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, even though now it's masked in in mm -hmm. various levels, mm -hmm. you know, but it's still an issue. Th those times it was very plain. If they, if they don't like you, they can call you a. Uh, those those in in England wasn't a nigger. You were called a coon. Yeah, which was even kind of worse. Yeah. You know, it's it's. An I'm familiar with coon. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, coming to Ghana, I felt like I was home. 
people mm. accepted me for who I was. I had family here. Apart from my mother, and my father and my sister, I had you know, an extended family here. And I had people who accepted me for who I was. And people, um, yes, maybe I was revered in certain circles, but those people around me, my family and, and so on, friends, just accepted me for who I was. And that for me was more important than anything else. You understand? Because at the end of the day, the, the, the reality is I, I don't see myself as really achieving anything special. You know, I, I didn't set out to achieve this. It, it happened. It happened, mm. yeah. You see the thing? It just happened. Yes, I, I, I was lucky. I made some great decisions, I guess, at the time. I put in the hard work that was needed at the time. But it wasn't something I sat down and say, oh, I'm going to do this. In two years, I'm going to do this. Sipa Gaige is going to offer me this. I'm going to reject it. They, and, and I'm going to come to Ghana. I'm, I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. To this day, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah. That's the honest God, you know, truth. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just doing it and living day to day, making the best decisions I, I, I can make given my current situation. Yeah, so, so I, I don't regret, basically, because mm. what has happened has happened. Right. I can't go back in time. And even if I did go back in time and fix those issues, would I be alive today? Who knows? That's it. You don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe I would have made my billions. Maybe I would have gone into hot air ballooning like uh, Richard Branson did and crashed and burned and, and died. <laughs> you see the thing? So yeah. It's a possibility, yeah. Anything yeah, could have happened. What so mean. what has happened is what should have happened and what did happen. You see the thing? So that, that's how I, how I look at, uh, at life. Um, yes, I have regrets. Sometimes I sit down and I, I get depressed thinking that... Yeah, I was you actually know, coming, you know, coming, it, coming it to happens. that. It happens yeah. because as um you might uh, um you you had you had a second question like um the yeah, business so, manager mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so so when yeah so yeah so as as I was saying I I didn't plan it okay a lot of this was based on having good people around you who would advise you you know my father because of the various work he did in various fields mm. um, he had a lot of uh, business people business executives that he had. Uh, maybe built a bathroom for or did their electrical work and they would come give me some jobs to do and then um, advise me that okay you should do this you should you know get an accountant you should do this you should invest your money here that those sorts of things so it, w it was I, I had no idea you know from the background I came from I had no idea in finance had no idea to handle money um, and all of that so and my father also didn't these sort of things. So, but fortunately, we, we had people around through his connections that did and, and offered the, the, you know, the, 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 the right advice at that time. Wow. So you know, getting a business manager and all these sorts of things because they, they obviously saw that, um, I believe that was a, there was a, a, a client my dad had called uh, Mrs. Courtney. And sorry to say, she was a horny woman. <laughs> so, and she, I, I want she, to meet him. She, cha she changed men like like you change your your your, your underwear. Yeah. yeah. And then there was one particular boyfriend she had who was a a businessman, and the guy was a scammer. I must say he's a scammer. <laughs> but he he and Mrs. Courtney was rich. You see the thing. So he was he was scamming her small small for cash. But he was the one that said no. You, you need a business manager. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Wow, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's how we ended up. Yep. You know, yeah. It. So 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 I want to ask you, right, right. Um, a young man, all of these things hitting you left and right, and all that. Was there a point that you were depressed, stressed? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. was it was it too much at a point? You know, even before my success, um, if if you if you look at my my music catalog there's one particular song called um just a bitter pill yep 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 yeah yeah yeah, 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 heard yeah, it, yeah. yeah. and um i i featured a, a rapper on there called chris k mm. who is paralyzed yeah and disabled and also went through similar issues so that song if you listen to just a bitter pill that every every word in that song is true okay. and it happened Dope. yeah um twice in my teens i tried to commit suicide Mm. Yeah, and um, the first one I don't for some reason I don't remember it clearly, but the second one I remember it so vividly. You know, um, I was 14 years old, 
And um, it got to the point where I just didn't see the value of life anymore because I felt like um, I'd been made to feel rather that I was nobody. I was useless. I, I, you know, I didn't deserve to be there. You see the thing that that was that was the reality. In, and, in uh, the UK, yeah, in the UK. I mean, the level of racism and bullying. Wow. Don't forget, at that point, I was the. There were two black kids in my school, and the school was at that point about seven hundred. Jesus. And it was a very rich. It's, it's almost like a Harry Potter school. The school was founded in 1615, mm. Mm. right? It's a grammar school, one of the top schools in the UK. And I just got there because I had great exam results and merits and all of that. Um, but, and, and I was on, um, I don't know if subsidies is the right word, but for instance, uh, lunchtime, I had to go into the headmaster's office every single day to get a token Jeez. to go and buy lunch. And they had to make it that obvious. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. So you walk in, you have to knock on the headmaster's uh, secretary's office and sign something. They'll give you the token. It's a, it was a coin. And then you have to go and use that coin to go and give it to the, the, the cashier in the canteen every lunch. Hmm. You see the thing? I was mean, it, was it, were you one of a few? Um, honestly, I don't remember any others. Mm. It was so shameful, mm -hmm. you know, and it was so embarrassing. So yeah. you don't even want to yeah, talk to yeah, anybody yeah, else yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, you yeah. see the thing? That's what I'm saying. So, so, like he, he had, he was like sticking out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Like you're yeah, the yeah, poor yeah. kid yep. and you have to go every day to beg literally mm -hmm. for yeah, your yeah, meal. Yeah, yeah. It would have to put you in some kind of. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if, you, if you think about it today, why? I mean, what was the need to do that? You get me? Why yeah. make the the person walk into the headmaster's of yeah. office, sign, yeah. That's take what that I was coin? Thinking about. You know, it, it, it was... It's dehumanizing. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah, just yeah. breaking you it down was, yeah. Yeah. to remind you every day that this is who you are. Don't mm -hmm. get yourself confused. That's it. That's you don't it. belong here. You don't belong here. That, that yeah. was it. So wow. yeah. that, that was the, the, the reality. I felt like I didn't belong. And if, if, you, if you listen to the, the lyrics of the song, I said, my, my father was to... Uh, white to be poor, mm. and my mother was too polite. Yeah. No, my, so I said my father was too. Uh, anyway, I've even forgotten my own, my own yeah, lyrics. Yeah. Man, at that yeah. age, I had to be horrified. Oh yeah, and that that was from eleven years. You see the thing going. Oh, so by the, by the time, and you have your 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 classmates and your you know, who who all came from wealthy you know wealthy backgrounds. You see the things, and you know their fathers had the latest cars and, yeah. and all of that, and you know they were going on all the skiing holidays, and mm. you're mm. not, and you know, so you you felt like an yeah. outcast, yeah. basically. Did you did you ever go to uni? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't because, um, in fact, because was, you were busy. <laughs> because I was running the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually about to go to uni, mm. even though I was running the business, um, and then that was when Chairman Rollins. Called me, called me to Yeah, Ghana. scooped you. you. Yeah. Scooped you. Yeah. What one thing did you learn from him? Um, holding to your principles and um, the truth, basically. Mm. The truth. No matter how bad it, it is or how raw it can seem, the truth, you know, holding to that truth. Yeah. That, 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 that's that's the, what I learned from him. Fred, Fred th th doesn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> Like me, like a, a few character. people. He's I mean, from the character. era. So, I'll say this. I think I have come to recognize his place in our history. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very critical of his methods. I don't question his motive or his intent because that's the part of what I'll call maturity now. Mm -hmm. I've watched his interviews. I've listened to him, especially the day that he passed. Uh, because he's such a central figure in my family's history. Right. That the day he passed was like a big day or a big moment where I had to call my brother. I'm like, did you hear? And for us, because of the trauma, it almost seemed like we were waiting for some day of, you know. Revenge in quotes. Or retribution. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah. He just died. Yeah. The guy just died. Yeah. A normal death. But when I reflect... That's why I say I don't question his intent because I, I truly believe that he loved this country and he wanted the best for it. Mm -hmm. What I don't agree with are just his methods. And as I get older, I start to question the people that were around him 
more than I question Rollins because I think if you're you're a thinker, there's a part of it that I believe there were machinations around and people were doing things and putting it on oh yeah. Rollins is the one yeah. that ordered it and da da da. But people had their own interests, there are people who were pulling strings and doing all all sorts. So at the end of the day, what I've come to accept is that he was essential. He needed to happen uh, for the country. But if I had my way, I, I would have hoped that he used different methods and mm -hmm. a different approach. Mm -hmm. right. And that's pretty right. much, yeah, that's pretty, pretty much it. And, but and I wanted to ask you um, something about, I find in interesting about you in general. So you're like, you're almost like a, a different version, if you will, of what the West would have placed a Mark Zuckerberg for, yeah, or yeah. potentially a Steve Jobs, or a, you know, e Elon, Elon, or whatever. But the funny thing is, two of my friends worked for you, okay. and I discovered this through me researching you before I got here. But mm -hmm. you opened a company, Soft. Yeah, so, Soft, yeah. Tribe? Soft Tribe. Now yeah. we're Soft Tribe yeah. now. Yeah. A, 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 yeah. Friend of, a, a friend of I used to work for him, Rudolf Akron. Okay, oh, so Rudolph. Ronnie, okay. yeah, Rudolph, yeah, Rudolph. Yeah, yeah. So, Martin okay, yeah. Okay. So Ronnie and uh, Papa Coleman, Ronnie Lai and Papa Coleman. Okay. But the interesting thing about this is that this is straight out of SS, and people are trying to find themselves, find mm -hmm. their feet. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie came to learn how to code from you. He still holds on to that experience he had with your company to this day. He defines it as the fundamental, like the foundation of what he learned to become, how he learned to become a professional. Mm -hmm. And he still uses the coding in various ways. Papa Coleman is doing well for himself somewhere in the world. But I want to dig a bit deeper into what I was trying to maybe steer. Maybe it's a selfish desire for myself. Because I grew up hearing your name, like I said, from a distance. Mm -hmm. Mensa is somebody that I have a ton of respect for. But the level to which he revered you. Mm -hmm. Still. Still. Is, is remarkable. Is because he spoke to you in such glowing, like Charlie with the good David Putting house, Charlie. Yeah, you know. <laughs> we, and this is when I was rapping with him, okay. fooling in the okay. backyard. I never took it to the next level because my granddad was strict as hell. I, I didn't mm. see how I was going to become a rapper. But Mensa was taking it to the next level. He's like, Charlie Fred, you have to come in. David, he has all the equipment. He has this. He has yeah. that. But it's like you nurtured so many people, and to entertainment culture in this country. I don't know if things would be the same if you did not happen. I don't know if maybe you're too modest to look at it from that perspective, but I, I'm thinking that if you ever, ever reflected on that, that's one aspect. That's entertainment. Mm. Then you go to the tech sector, which is a, a huge sector. You, you open soft at a time where when Ronnie was learning how to code, it was unheard of mm -hmm. in this country, period. Like yeah. I went to, my mom sent me to computer school, Omari, um, okay. yeah, Omar. yeah. Right, right. then yeah. In, in, people they see me like super that I'd be, I'm grateful to my mom to this day because there's so many people in our generation who don't even fool with email yeah my class <laughs> need to touch yeah, email. Yeah, yeah. I know more boys they don't mess around with it so I think people mm. especially you because you had that exposure that level of reverence from not the just Ghana but you were validated in the west already in the UK before you got here for me the way that I look at your place in our society is like the terms in which I put you in, like the Elon, the Zuckerbergs, because you have done so much that I personally have experienced other people talk about yeah. that maybe you may not hear as readily or maybe you close your ears to, but I think you've been vital to our cultural progress, our tech progress, and um, if you say you don't regret anything, then I, I also come to believe that you were sent to us for a particular reason yeah. and we're grateful for that. We're grateful for the work that you've done for in both industries and um, yeah. I, I hope that you keep keep you know working at it. Yeah. So I didn't have a question there. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't so know let's, how to come back with that, but uh, yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. You. So let's say. so let's come to audio sound. Mm -hmm. You know, um I first came to your space with Mensa, I don't know if it's 2000s. And I'm like, ah, David, like, is it, is it the same guy? I was like, yeah, Charlie, yeah. You know, it's the same, it's the same guy. <laughs> you were known for tech. 
Mm -hmm. right? It was tech throughout. In my house, you were known for tech. Right, right. When did music find a place in your life? That's the interesting thing. And, and that, that's what a lot of people ask me. But music was there before the tech. Wow. Music was there before the tech. Um, you know, one, one of the great things about the, I don't know if it still happens now, but the, the, the British um, educational system back mm. then, mm -hmm. by the time you are seven, you have to pick an instrument. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's, it was taken very seriously. So if you're picking piano, um, flutes, saxophone, yeah. whatever, uh, you have to pick an instrument and then that you have to then take uh, uh, classes in that. Yeah. So um, I, I ended up picking the violin when I was seven. And, um, you know, from seven up until about uh, 12, 13, you know, I'd, I'd, you know they, they have um, an examination system with, with uh, music, mm -hmm. you know, musical instruments at that point, um, grade, I think, one to ten. And, um, you know, 10 being like the, you know, the virtuoso, yeah. you see the thing, once you get there. Um, I think I got to grade six mm. um, and I was playing in the orchestra, oh. um, you know, a huge orchestra of 100, 100 plus and all of that. You know, I, I was in the second violin section. Mm. Mm. You know, so you, you had to understand music theory. You had to understand um, harmony your place in in the orchestra why you are playing this line mm -hmm. at that point yeah. and you know all of the um terminology of um you know crescendos and, yeah. and allegro and all of this you know mm -hmm. so that that uh, that gave me a huge grounding in in music theory understanding was this public school by the way uh this was um yeah, from, from primary school was public school. And then secondary school was the, the grammar school that, yeah, that, yeah. that I ended up. But when you were picking the violin, this was public in school? In public school, yeah. In okay. prim primary school, seven years old, you have wow. to pick it. So, yeah. you know, in, in England, those times you started uh, primary at five years. So after the first, second, so the third year, you, you pick an instrument and then um, take you through from, the, from there. Uh, so, yeah, so I learned, I learned um, a lot of the fundamentals from, from, from uh, you know, that that educational system mm. and then um i always wanted to create music um and then with my tech background that's when i remember very clearly it was vivid uh, i went to a, a an exhibition um in 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 london where they it was all it was a computer you know tech mm -hmm. tech mm -hmm. and again before the internet days yeah. and all of that and then there was one stand where they had something called midi <laughs> Midi. <laughs> Midi. And then this guy had set up a rack of synthesizers and then there was this computer and it was playing a whole symphony, you know, uh, with, and he was just there doing everything. One man playing a whole symphony. Yeah. It was classical music mm. and it sounded so authentic, you know, and, and I, I remember it just hit me that I want to do this. Yeah. I want to do this. At that point, I'm, I must have been about... 11 or 12, wow. 11 or 12. So um, because I was fortunate that I, uh, by the time I was 12, I started making money yeah. from, from the tech, mm -hmm. you know, because my father, as I said, he had some, some customers who needed things done. So they would give me spreadsheets and I had to create the spreadsheets for them. Mm. Um, that, that same man that was with the horny, the horny woman. Shout out to Miss Courtney. I like so, Miss Courtney. Actually. Yeah, Mrs. Courtney. She, she really, yeah. you know, she's instrumental. In, 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 in so um, he used to do that and he'll pay me for every spreadsheet. He would pay me. Mm. And then one time he got this big contract where they had taken a huge survey uh, from an exhibition, another exhibition, they'd taken a huge survey and people had filled out forms mm. and I had to collate all of that information and then do statistical analysis on it. And I made, I think at that point, I made probably a couple of thousand pounds from doing that. But it was tedious work, keying in every single yeah. you know, form and all of that and then doing all the reporting. I made a couple of thousand pounds, which was a huge amount of money for me. I was maybe 12 years old. Wow. And I couldn't imagine what I was going to do with that. So... Um, again, another one of my father's friends who happened to be a biker. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in, in England, uh, in England, those times, bikers, uh, you, you've heard of the Hells Angels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, this guy was a Hells Angel. Mm. I mean, some rough looking, 
guy, but he was so soft when mm. you, when you really get to know him. And um, he had uh, a sound module, and I remember clearly it was a Yamaha FB01 sound module, and it had a 16-note polyphony, mm. or was it eight-note polyphony? One of the one of the two. It had some sounds, built-in sounds, mm. and you could you could alter the presets and save yeah. them and all of that. And then he had a keyboard, a MIDI keyboard. So I bought them off of him. You know, he was he was selling them because he had upgraded. Mm. Bought that, and that was my first entry into making music and producing these other things. So then I had uh, got got a computer from there, mm. managed to patch it all together, and I could actually do some you know very basic uh, yeah. production work. And that that FBO one actually made it to Ghana. When when I came to Ghana, yeah, you, you came yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where it is now, mm. but it made it, it made it to Ghana. Mm. Oh. Um, so uh, yeah, that was my entry into production. So by the time I came to Ghana, um, when I was seventeen, I brought the studio, which was the four track, the the Amiga, and you know the 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 FBO one, and then a keyboard, a synthesizer mm. that I'd managed to acquire, and that's what we started the studio with in in mm. that time, New Achimota. That's when we met Kiki Jan and Atongo oh, and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So that that built up my my love of creating music. Yeah. Sort of thing. So then it just it was just a natural progression. Even to today, it's it's a natural progression. I every single day I spend probably not less than two or three hours just learning new techniques. I'm on YouTube constantly. Mm. You know, learning mixing techniques, production techniques. Vocal tracking techniques, vocal tuning techniques, mastering techniques, and all of that, Ooh. because things are changing. All, I, I all was, the I was time. actually coming come, come to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep up. Yeah, you, you have, have to keep, keep up. up. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, do you still code? Uh, you know, you know the funny thing about coding, mm. I never enjoyed it. No. Oh. I was good at it. Yeah, but you. You know, it came naturally, but I never enjoyed it. So, um. I still do code occasionally. Mm. Um, in fact, just as I was walking in to, to come and see you, I had mm. a call from a client. So tomorrow I have to do some coding. Mm. But it's, it's, it's something that I do out of necessity. And the coding I do now is based on is the legacy systems mm. because we have the young coders and programmers that we, we have in, in, on our staff that handle all the new systems. Yeah. But um, I still handle some legacy systems from, mm. you know, 10, 15 years ago, yeah. which, are, which are still in use. Um, during this interview, you know, um, like I said, R Rudolf Akron, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I, ca I called him to talk to him about, about the podcast, have, have, having you. And Mensa, my Mensa, I, my Mensa is, is one person I speak to every single hour. Okay. Like, not every day, every single hour. <laughs> right, right. You know, I'll be there and we'll say, Kwasia. So I was <laughs> like, you know, Chai, David is, is actually coming, coming, you know, in today. So what should I ask him? <laughs> and, and the Mensa gave me a list wow. of, you know, things to ask you. And one thing that ran through these two people I spoke to is how you know everything, but at the same time, calm. It's, it's an act. <laughs> Believe me, it's an act. <laughs> That's you know, uh, but at the same time, calm. You know, Rudolph was like, Chada guy, you go feel talk to him about, about everything. Or, you know, you go feel talk to him about everything. You know, you go feel talk to him about everything. But one thing Rudolph asked me was, Aside sound, as, as, aside your the work that 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 you have done for Ghana, it's your love for drones. Okay. And I'm like, oh shoot, I forgot <laughs> right, because back right. then on your Instagram you were always posting, mm -hmm, you know, your mm -hmm. your your drone videos. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there is this thing that's running through everything that you like tech, like. Like yeah, tech, yeah. like you are, you are so into tech. Right. The cutting edge of it, like before yeah, it becomes you are a thing. so into right, tech. Right, 
like how why like and is there a point where you would stop following tech because you just said that you are on youtube getting you know info updating yeah, himself yeah. like of, mm-hmm. like is there a point where you are going to go like oh, i'm tired of tech you know because you mm-hmm. saw this roadcaster and you go oh oh so this <laughs> you know and right, all that right. like you know you are so in tune with with tech is there a point where you are going to go like okay fine i'm done with tech when ai takes over <laughs> <laughs> Which is not, I was going to ask you about AI it's and then iOS yeah. and then uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Android. Mm-hmm. Should we be threatened by AI? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But but I I guess it won't it make things easier because pe- people are now writing their CVs and uh, exams with with a- yeah, AI. Are things meant to be easier? Uh-oh. Is life meant to be easy? Really. Well. You get me? What, what is, the, the, and again, it comes down to what is the point of life? You know, is, is it, is the point of life for us to have everything so easy that we don't have a challenge in life? You sort of thing. Then who are we as human beings? Just, just think about it. Uh, uh, any, any um, creature in the wild, mm-hmm. every single day, their life is being threatened. You sort of thing. Yeah. And, and they, they, you know, and until the day it happens, and inevitably it will, mm-hmm. um, they are constantly on the, that knife's edge of survival. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You see the thing? Yeah. And somehow, as human beings, we seem to think that we should be in a comfortable situation, you know, where things shouldn't trouble us. You know, we should be safe, we should be secure. Mm. That's not the reality of the world we live in. You see the thing? Look, at any point in time, the very ground you're, you're standing on right now, we could have an earthquake and this building will tumble down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You sort of thing. We've had a few tremors recently. Yeah, yeah. It could happen. And, and not that it could happen. It will happen at some point. We've had major earthquakes and yeah. we will have another major earthquake. Yeah. So when, when you look at that, your, your whole basis of your being, the very ground you, you, <laughs> you stand on mm. is not stable. So why do you expect that your life should be stable. It, it can't. It can't be. You, you have periods of stability. Yeah. Yeah? I mean, and, and it's, it's proven. I mean, look at, look at our economy. You know, the world economy, not, not even just Ghana. I mean, Ghana, there. Well, I don't even want to talk about that, but mm-hmm. the world economy, mm-hmm. it is a, it's just a cycle of us doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. We boom, we bust. We say, oh, we have to put protections in place. We have to do that. When, when things start getting better and the money is coming in and we're growing and we're obsessed with growth, then we boom again and we bust again. Yep, we get reckless. Look what's happened now in the banking system in, in the US. It's yeah. about to collapse. Yeah. The banks are going to collapse again. And it just happened when? 2008. Yeah. Yeah. And it's happening again now. They didn't now. learn a thing from it. We didn't learn anything. And it, it happened in 1990. I remember there was a serious recession just, yeah. just before I came to Ghana. There was a serious recession. Yeah. We don't learn as human beings. You understand? But uh, in terms of AI, why? Look, even coders now, mm. we, we, you know, I still engage a lot with, with uh, people who are heavily involved in coding. Mm. Even coders now use chat, chat GPT. My <laughs> son, who mm. is in university doing computer science, used chat GPT. He said the thing. He mm. uses it regularly. It's now become the standard thing. Mm. But isn't tech supposed to make our lives easy? Easy. You have been into tech. You have seen tech mm-hmm. grow, and now it's at a point where we have AI. Yes. Shouldn't we just go with the flow? Yeah, but it makes our life easier, which is a good thing. It's. It, I mean, we to all want an extent, easier. Yeah. We all want an easier life, but it's making us more and more stupid. Or as a stupid person would say, stupider. Yeah. That, that's reality. We have access to a wealth. I mean, look, we have access to the world now with our phone. What do we use our phones for? Mm. Instagram, TikTok. Yeah. And Pornhub has become bigger and than porn. This, uh, it's ever been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see the thing? What, that's what we use our phone for. Yeah. Instead of enlightening ourselves. You see the thing? There's so much you can learn on um, all of these platforms. But we, we'll be looking at the latest dance. We'll be looking at you know, how to cook this, how to do that, you know. And they, they so there's something I wanted to touch on uh, when you were talking about your 
education mm-hmm. at seven, picking up the violin because you were made to pick an instrument. Mm-hmm. And I was asking whether it was public school at the time because I'm curious that is that still the standard in the UK? You know, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm okay. not sure it is, but it certainly isn't in Ghana. I mean, we've 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 watered down our education system here so much. Because my dad was made to play guitar, he had to pick an infant's uh-huh. When I went to infant's there was no such thing. Yeah. Exactly. So to build on that, I'm I'm asking if you see a relevance in your training, your upbringing, mm-hmm. in how effective you became in what we from as outsiders who are not in your field see as oh this is genius this is super like you know high level thinking techie stuff Mm -hmm. does it feel like it came natural to you because of the way you grew up and the things you were exposed to or do you feel like it's something that you had to seek out on your own to try and get like you know an understanding of or an appreciation of you know if you look at um historically as Mm -hmm. as a as a race as a human race Mm -hmm. when we develop the the most and the fastest is in times of turmoil and Mm -hmm. challenge yeah technology develops fastest during wars you know it is the sad truth Mm -hmm. you know that that's when we we developed the the jet engine for example it was as a result of the Second World War, they needed planes to be able to go faster yeah. and farther. You sort of thing. So they, they had to create a new type of engine mm-hmm. that could do that to, w- to win the war, to kill more people, basically. Yeah. You sort of thing. And that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the technology we possess now is from um, a bad place. I don't know if, if that's the right word to use, but um, a lot of things we have, um, the, the initial... Um, idea behind it, the conception was um, coming from a negative viewpoint. Mm. Sort of thing. I mean, look at nuclear power. Mm-hmm. It became a thing because we needed to create the bomb. Yeah, yeah, to try and end the, the Second World War. Yeah, it, it wasn't that we we wanted to create nuclear power. That mm. came later. Yeah, the bomb was first. Mm-hmm. The power was was secondary. You see, so. Um, Essentially, we learn from challenge. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be a war, but we learn from challenge. When, when something is not going as we perceive it should, right. we try and come up with solutions to that. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, I'm a product of that. Okay. You sort of thing. Through, through my, my challenges, my embarrassments, my, my, uh, my perception of being an outcast as growing up, it forced me to overperform. Mm and outperform my peers so that I could be seen mm. as an equal. Yeah. Mm. And maybe I overshot the mark. Uh-huh. <laughs> you see the thing. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was, it was through that challenge and through that um, despair. Mm-hmm. You see the thing. Mm. Um, you know, that, that to the point where I tried to commit suicide. You see the thing. And mm. that, that level of despair, that it that's not, yeah. It's, it's not a good thing. But then, you know, that, that's, that's what did it. And if you look at um, most of the, developments we've had to this point has been from people who are quite uh, messed up really <laughs> you yeah. know challenged people have done the most yeah you mm. see the thing and that that's that's you know look it's just simple when you're comfortable you do less mm. you see the thing and and that's the situation that again why i think ai is dangerous mm. that it is making us do less and less and less yeah. you have a dope I, I, I don't know if I, I should call it a studio because it's a whole, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a dope space. Where is right, it? Right, um, right. McCarthy Hill. McCarthy, McCarthy Hill. Hill. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a complex. Yeah, yeah it's, exactly. It's complex, that I think, yeah. you know, yeah. where you have like different studios and, and, and all that. And the only time I heard about it was a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why? haven't I heard about this space, you know, because I think it's going to be dope for, you know, residencies, you know, camps mm-hmm. and, 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 all, and all that. Mm-hmm. What was the idea behind that space and why isn't it everywhere in our faces? Because I know people who would want such a space to create. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the first answer to that is it's it's still very new. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't officially launched. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's um, uh, it's actually a record label, mm. um, a global record label. Um, you know us as DKB. Yeah. But we have morphed, and uh, the team has grown larger. We have major investment on mm. on board, uh, foreign investment. Oh, um, okay. And, uh, you know, from, from the States, and when I say major, I'm talking about multi, multi-million dollar mm. investment. Um, so essentially, we, we are, we've created a record label. So the, the thinking behind setting up the studios was that we need the right space, the right equipment, the right environment for the artists that we will sign mm. to be able to be as creative as, as possible to produce the sound that com- can compete on the global the global uh, market yeah i mean l- look let's be realistic in ghana there's no industry <laughs> you know I, there's no I, industry I, I, i've been saying this yeah there's no industry yeah. i mean where where you can only have maybe the top 3 artists who are doing anything significant the yeah. rest of them are just struggling mm. you know that that's the sad reality they're struggling yeah. and you know even even if you look at our our great artists of of the last generation our mm-hmm. Kodrio entries Entry, our yeah. lumbers and machi Dedes, they all had to do something else yeah to make ends meet yeah, yeah. and they were probably more successful than the current crop yeah. of artists yeah. in terms of I the agree. music yeah yeah they made money those days they were buying cds they were buying cassettes they mm-hmm. were touring all over the country they made a lot of money but even there they had you know the 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 cocoa season and then the, mm-hmm. the dry seasons and mm-hmm. so on so they they had to get into other things yeah which which is not such a bad yeah. thing anyway yeah. i mean even the major artists outside like the rihannas the pdds and mm-hmm. jay-z's and all of that they're doing other things yeah. and that's where yeah. the real money comes but um yeah so we want we want to basically create a label that we can develop artists we can push them onto the global scale because it doesn't cost a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars to blow an artist globally you're mm-hmm. looking at millions of dollars yeah mm-hmm. yeah and just to produce um, one single a major label can spend 2.5 million dollars just pushing one yeah. single just one single or not yeah. even an album mm-hmm. you see the thing so and who in ghana can afford to do that I mean, even at our level, we can't afford to do that, mm. you know, on, on a single basis. But at least we understand that um, if you're dealing in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can make inroads mm. that will push the artist to a certain level where we can then start talking business with the, la- with the majors. Yeah. You understand? Uh, which is what the Nigerians have done. They, they've managed to understand this is the space they are in. This is the industry. This is how they have to push these are the n- contacts they have to make um, globally. Mm. I have to, uh, someone like uh, Davido. He had to pay Chris uh, Brown a lot of money to do that first feature. Yeah. yeah. Right. Knowing that he was not going to make that money back off of that off of that single, but over three, four, five years, mm. he will become so big mm. that now Chris Brown will be paying him to feature on his yeah. his record. You see the thing. So we have to look at it from the long, the long game, you know, the long, the, the, the long point of view. And we have to understand that it's, it's a business. Mm. You don't set up a, um, a, a soft drink manufacturing plant with $100. Mm. Yeah. You're looking at, you know, huge investment. You just got to set up a factory. Yeah. So that's what we did. You know, we, we spent over half a million dollars just setting up that place. It's, wow. it's a lot of investment. And we haven't even finished. We're setting up a full live studio mm. and we're setting up a Dolby Atmos certified mm. studio as well. So we understand that, look, to get things going, you have to play at the major league level. Otherwise, yeah. whatever artist, someone like Black Sheriff is a fluke, right? He's been very successful so far, but it's a fluke. It shouldn't be a fluke. It should be a business yep. strategy that if I have five artists and I apply this, this formula, I should get one or two of them being global, global yeah. hits, global stars. You understand? It's, it's been done for decades and um, we're not reinventing the wheel, but yeah. we understand that the wheel is big and it has to be greased. 
Yeah. You yeah. understand? So that that's how we that's how we're looking dope, at it. Dope, dope. I've just read you 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 have to see the space. Yeah. Like like. Uh, Alvin, um, Niv. Yeah. He he invited me to this space in, I want I don't want to say Joel. It's uh, uh, Kaukudi. Yeah. After that, that somewhere yeah, around that. Yeah, yeah. Pig farm. Pig farm, yeah. yeah I, I know okay. that space. Okay. Yeah. As soon yeah. as you turn yeah. the left at the light, yeah, it's yeah, on yeah, the yeah, right. It's, it's um, on the right, yeah. yeah. That's one of the biggest studios I've... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Black, um, what, was, what was the name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ludacris yeah, was just there recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. So this but, place but, is bigger. Oh! It's not... Uh, you see, these things now, it's not It's not about the size the size anymore. You see the thing? because Well, true. Yeah. The size is important if you're housing an orchestra or a choir. You understand? But even even with that these days... You don't bring in the whole choir to record one take. You know, you, you section them yeah. off because you want to be able to mix and get the right sound. You sort of thing. So if you look at um, the top studios now, they're not huge in terms of space, yeah. but they're huge in terms of the equipment, equipment. Um, the treatment of the room, the acoustics, and the, also the, the engineering know-how, mm. which is probably the most important thing because yeah. with... The, with um, I mean, I was admiring this this uh, mixing. Mm -hmm. I say a mixing board or a desk, yeah. if you like. The what you can produce with this, you'd be amazed. You could produce a Grammy-winning yeah. record with yeah. this. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, easily. Yeah, easily. You could produce a yeah. Grammy-winning record with this. It's but it's the know-how, yeah. understanding, you know, the 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 physics of audio and how that translates into the digital domain. And, and how it's processed mm. and how, what all those things, so that that that's why I I still spend hours every day learning, because things change and I, I don't know everything. Mm. You sort of thing. So I'm I'm always trying to learn new techniques. Dope, dope, awesome. mm. dope. Um. So last lastly, um. You are not just behind the scenes. You are also at the forefront. You know, you have been doing music. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. for a very, very long time. Right. Yeah. Um, you have been at the forefront too. You know, um, was it like, we all know that, yeah, you like sound, but did you feel that you also had to, you know, sing because you had everything at your disposal? Um, me singing uh you know from day one i've always been an artist and a performer yeah you understand from from day one so uh yes i can take the back seat and mm. i can produce can, yeah yeah which i also love doing but um you know that that for many years i allowed that to um suppress my own artistic mm. you know dreams and ambitions I had. Mm. So I think back in 2018, when, when we got back into the music scene again, and we set up the studios and all of that, um, I said, no, I'm going to make sure that I focus on me. <laughs> yeah. Know, from, from, you know, yeah. because look, yeah. it's, it's never too late. Yeah. You understand? And, and I, especially nowadays, the way things have changed and it's, it's amazing now that as a, as a, an artist, any kind of creative, you can talk directly to your yeah, your yeah, fan base now, yeah. mm -hmm. whereas you couldn't before. Yeah, you needed to go through a label. You needed yeah. to go through a publishing house if you were an author. Um, as an artist, you probably needed to go through some some kind of uh, yeah. gallery or whatever. Gallery, but yeah. now, you can go directly to the to to the customer. Straight. Yeah, you can talk to them, and you know it's it's an amazing time that we live in. So uh, for me. It's it. I I love creating. I love writing music. I love producing. I love exploring mm. what I can do. Yeah. So um, that's why I don't necessarily stick to a particular genre. Yeah. I like you know doing all all kinds of things. I I, I always want to learn basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Dope. Dope. And guys, you have to, you know, there is this video of you. I haven't watched that video in a while, but I watched it when it came out of you and Samini. Yeah. 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 You know. Yeah. Panji always tells me that when it comes to music videos, you have to make it, you know, l l larger than life. <laughs> right, right. That video is dope, Fred. You have to, you, you really yeah, have him to. Him and Samini. Yeah, 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 yeah. You really, it's a, it's a dope song and a very, very dope vi video. I'll check I think, it out. Mm -hmm. I think you even played, like you portrayed, like you being a king in that video. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we right? Actually, we shot yeah. that in my hometown. 
yeah, yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. That video is yeah. so dope. Yeah. And I want to talk about loyalty with you, like, mm-hmm. and I'm, and I'm, and this is going to be the last question because of rush. Okay, let me just yeah. take you back. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the the new song again. We are pushing boundaries. Yeah. Um, it's actually an animated video. Yeah, I, I, right? I saw. Animated yeah. video. And if you look at the level of detail of mm. the animation, it took 18 months to create that video. It was created right here in Ghana by a Ghanaian. Mm. Right? And if, if you look at the level of detail and... Uh, I don't know if it, how to explain it. If, if you look at the, the reflections on the glass, the, the, mm. it's, it's so real. It's truly at Pixar level. Yeah. If you really look at yeah. it, and every time you watch it, you see something that you haven't noticed before. You know that it's so. What and if if you look at the video as well, you see that there are Ghana flags everywhere. I'm wearing. I'm a. I'm an astronaut in in the in the video. Yeah, yeah, going yeah. going to space. If you if you listen to the sound itself, and the video, mm. they are both at. What's a grade A quality? Yeah. You know that it it could stand up being played on MTV. Hey, does MTV still exist? I, yeah. I hear that. I know were. the, I heard yeah. things, so, some room of them shutting down. Yeah, or something yeah, like that. yeah. But um, it could stand up against yeah. any any video anywhere. You see the thing? World and class. World class. And yeah. the sound, you see the thing. So that, we, we want to show that it's, it's, look, Ghana, we have everything. Yeah. What we don't have is the application. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, and but it's something that we can also learn to have. Yeah. You know, with with some discipline, I yeah. think that that that's truly our our our, our shortcoming at the moment is is discipline mm. and accountability. You see the thing; those those are the two things that we really need to deal with. Top, 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 top. Um, so um, I mean, guys, Charlie, you guys should just Google David Kwamina Bolton, you know, on YouTube or even in Google search and. You'll find so many things, you know. And shouts to Rush, you know, your your guy, mm-hmm. you know. And I was going to ask, I wanted to ask, like, how have you been able to maintain your relationship with him? Because I see DKB and Rush as Jay-Z and Tai Tai or, yeah. you know, like tight Mm -hmm. you know how Mm -hmm. have you been able to maintain your relationship with him maybe it's something that you know we would you know learn um one not to overthink it and two i guess i guess mutual respect Mm. mutual respect um you know and, and and um understanding that we are two different people yeah but we want the same thing but we come mm. at it from different angles. Mm. Yeah. Rush yeah. is called Rush for a very good reason. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. So the, in, in, you know, you, you mentioned so many times that I, I appear to be calm. Calm, yeah. Yeah. So Rush is the opposite of that. Yeah, yeah. But that blend is what works. Yeah. You see the thing? Because me, those times when we were recording VIP and yeah. so on, yeah. I couldn't handle VIP. I mean, I'll just, for me, it's like I'm a, like a light switch. I'm either on or I'm off. Yeah. If if you do something to offend me, I'll probably I, I'll just walk away. You see the mm. thing? Yeah, I'll just walk away, and I, I, I maybe I I won't work with you again. Yeah. You see the thing? But um, Rush will deal with you <laughs> there and then. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? So the the yeah. amount of times he he sacked VIP mm. from the studio. I mean, more than ten times when we were recording their their, their album. Wow. You know. Um, so, I mean, literally sack them and they have to go home and then maybe come back a, a week know. later or two weeks wow. later. So it took it took maybe about nine months to record their, their album because wow. they, they were so rowdy and unruly. <laughs> but then at the same time, he understands people. Yeah. So when it comes to recording the vocals, he handles all of that. So mm. the, the actual engineering, the audio engineering stuff of getting a good source signal. Yeah which is vital for mixing yep. you know that there's there's a saying that you can't polish shit right yeah, yeah. you can't you understand so once one, one something is is bad 
you can't do anything about it. So that that source material has to be the best that it can yep. be. Yeah. So um, that is what he's responsible for. He knows how to get the best performance mm. out of an artist. Mm. Yeah. He can he can you know make them feel at ease, or if they need to be on edge, he, yeah. he knows he knows what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So that um, because he knows that if it's not right, I'll reject it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, th we we had a situation recently where. Um, um, an artist, you know, uh, uh, in fact, a manager that we we work with very very much, um, and he wanted to come and mix a particular song, and the the vocals were just not up to it, and and he was trying to force us to mix it, and I told him no. So and I told him unless Rush comes to re-record the vocals, it's not happening. So it's sitting there; it's not been dealt with. I don't know if they've taken it to another mm. another mixer to 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 deal with it. But at the end of the day, it's called a record for yeah, a reason. Yeah. It's there for life. Yeah. So make it the best that it can possibly be. We're still playing Bob Marley's songs. How long has he been dead? Mm. Over 30 40, something, yeah, 40, 40, 40 yeah, years yeah, now. Yeah, he died, 20. what, 80? Was it 81? Yeah. Wow. His song still sounds beautiful. You play it on any system. It's balanced. It's clear. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, everything is there. And you don't, not a single day has passed since he passed that his song has not been played in almost every single yeah. country of the world. Yeah, that is, it's true and it's it, it, crazy. It'd be crazy. It'd be crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob, as for Bob, Bob, I don't joke with yeah. Bob. Yeah. So imagine if those songs were not recorded well. Yeah. They, they, would, they wouldn't have been played true, today. True, true. So, so, so basically, we all need a rush in our lives. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Chai, Fred. <laughs> You know it, <laughs> Charlie. It's been, Charlie, it's, it's been, it's been like engaging, and you know, um, I, I, I was, I was, I've been so into the conversation from the beginning, yeah, from jump, you know, from jump till now. Um, I think he was a little worried about when you were coming and the direction of the conversation, but yeah, I told you what happened. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like. The conversation was what it needed to be yeah because it yeah. always comes from a genuine place yeah. and i meant every word i said about you because uh, like i said growing up hearing about you was almost like a celeb yeah. somewhere or this myth of a human being somewhere doing something so crazy because men are somebody even though he's my peer mm. he, there's some of your peers that you revere in terms of their intellect mm. and yeah Mensa was the type of guy. He would make up stuff on the go. He was funny. Yeah. He was yeah. smart. And I, and I wanted to get into the artists that he's worked with, but I know that we would not yeah, finish, finish now. <laughs> Maybe we'll you have know. to pull him in yeah. once the record, like, you because know. Because mm -hmm. any record, most of the time you hear DKB, you know. <laughs> right, right. That's him. David, we thank you for coming to the podcast and we appreciate you and... I mean, what yeah. happened to the Porsche before we we cut it off? What? The Porsche that you bought in London. Uh, in fact, what did happen to it? That was when I was fifteen. Um, man, I can't even remember. Wow. Because I left. I would love to find it somewhere. I if, left. If um, I think my business manager ended up with it because okay. he was driving it. Mm. Okay. I think he ended up with it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 That would be some thing to archive if he still has it somewhere yeah in case. We need by, that now, back. by now it's be a classic <laughs> yeah yeah, classic. yeah yeah we need yeah. a back you know mm -hmm. and, and we need a full dkb movie at some point when you're yeah. old and old and gray I, I wow. the story needs I, to be I think, told i think you deserve a documentary that'll be yeah. something mm. yeah you know the yeah, story has to be because, told like yeah. a child prodigy phenom yeah. yeah we don't tell enough of our own stories and i think a lot of young people could be inspired by it, knowing mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. you've been able to achieve. Because yeah. at 12, doing real business, it's crazy. 15, doing real business. It's crazy. That's, that's remarkable. So, Chai, guys, share, listen, you know, review. Yeah. And Charlie. Comment. Yeah. Um, another episode, If More, Let's Divide. Yes, sir. We are through. Hey, hey, Charlie.